Okay, welcome to Flipgrid Tips and Tricks. Um, this is going to be an overview of the Flipgrid platform, which allows students to share short video recordings in response to topics that you post. Um, I want to just start with a disclaimer that I am in no way affiliated with Flipgrid. They do their own training and they are fantastic with it. Um, the drawback is that they have such a large audience that it's not particularly interactive when they do um, their own recordings. So this is a smaller size and hopefully you'll be able to ask and get some answers to questions that you have along the way. I still highly recommend their training. It is engaging and fast paced and, and a good thing to do in addition to this. So I am affiliated with um, the NASA IV and B facility in Fairmont, West Virginia. I work at the Educator Resource Center. They're doing all kinds of STEM outreach. Usually I'm traveling around the state and talking about our equipment loan program um, and getting teachers trained on that so they can use our hands-on stuff in their classroom or working at robotics tournaments. Um, but now I'm doing online trainings to try to give you some innovative ways to engage and reach your students in science and, and anything really. Um, we're a collaboration between NASA and Fairmont State University and both of them are so supportive of us and we're very grateful for the sort of unique opportunities we have as being a joint operation between them. Uh, my goal today is to give you a brief overview of Flipgrid so if you've never heard of it before um, you should have a good understanding of what it is after that. I'm going to give you some tips that are going to make it more useful and um, easy for you to implement in your classroom. Uh, I'm going to have some time built in for if you are familiar with Flipgrid to share some just suggestions. I used it for about a year in my classroom before I took this job and so I am not by any means an expert in this and I'm sure some of you have some things that I would be loving to hear from and ways that I could improve talking about Flipgrid and sharing access. And then at the end I'll stay on for people who want some one-on-one -on -one assistance with getting their accounts set up and things like that. So we shouldn't um, take the full hour with the overview but I'll be here then and beyond if you need support with that. So my goal for you is to get you comfortable enough that you could start using Flipgrid today if you would like to um, and that you at least have two helpful things if you are familiar with Flipgrid from the start the two helpful improvements that you would you would be able to add to your Flipgrid knowledge. Okay, so before we really get into it and I show you the website, let me tell you a little bit about why I think it's such a great tool. Um, it allows students to see and communicate with each other and that's always important, but especially now when we're not having that face-to-face -face daily interaction in our classrooms. It is asynchronous, so students don't have to have access to technology at a specific time and internet connectivity and be able to log in. They can access the site anytime, day or night, and post the videos that they need. Um, it can be accessed from any browser or mobile device, and it's really simple to um, post no matter what format you're using. It's kind of platform neutral. It is a free service. Um, it's affiliated with Microsoft. Microsoft purchased Flipgrid a couple of years ago, and they made it free. And that means that students can use their K-12 email accounts to um, log in, so they don't need to remember a separate um, login. That's good for older students who have their emails. If you're working with a younger, like elementary school population, you can also just assign them a code that's anywhere from two to eight digits, I think. So you could use their class number for them to allow them to sign in, and they wouldn't need anything more complicated than that. Um, and one of the other cool things is that it'll allow screen capture now. And so students can share um, their screens and any presentation that they're doing, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's my, that's my pitch on why this is such a cool uh, product. So before I get into this, I do want to show you this site. When you just go to the main site, this is what you see. Students will go down to this part where it says enter a flip code to get in there. If you want to sign up, you click the sign up button. I'm already um, logged in in this other tab, so I'm just going to do that. I have two grids. One is set up as a public PLC, which means anyone can access it and anyone with either a Microsoft or a G Google email can post videos to it. So you don't have to just use this in classrooms. This could be something that's done for a collaborative PLC that reaches people across the country and across the world. Um, but then I also have one that's set up for the course that I'm teaching that's um, Geosphere, it's science for 
elementary school majors, okay? And I'm gonna just show you um, the topics in here, but we're not gonna go into the videos because the topics only have my silly face on them and the um, videos themselves have my students and I'm not gonna share their information. So I set this up because there was a gas leak at Fairmont State in February. And so there were a couple of days where we couldn't have classes. And then we just continued this as um, we were unable to have in-person classes. So they were posting and um, I'd give them a prompt and something that they needed to talk about and then they would talk and show about it. So for our unit on soils, they had to post a picture of some soil and talk about the characteristics. I had them do some kind of chemical reaction that they could do with things they had around their house. Um, part of their thing was to do a weather project and there's this cool globe activity where you take a blue and a white piece of paper and you do a percentage of the sky that's covered. So they showed that and they could guess at what percentage um, their Pierce clouds were at. So that's that one. Um, and then in here, we have uh, different, different boards, but this one, Josh and I just introduced a couple webinars that we have. So if you would like to go in there and see what this is like as a student, I would recommend, and I'm putting these links in the chat, going to info.flipgrid.com, and then the flip code you would enter for this um, grid is IVVERC. That's our, that's our public one. So if you would do that now and just poke around a little bit, um, that'll let you see the videos. It will let you record a video if you would like to. There are multiple topics in there. So when you go in to that grid, it'll look like this. This link always threw me off when I was doing this, but the, if you click on the flip code itself, it will um, give you the student view. So when you're in here, I have this topic pinned, click here for the list of topics. And when you click on it, you can go to tips and questions. So if you have a question or something you would like to um, post as something helpful for all of us, you can record it in there. You may not be able to do that while you're doing Zoom because it's using your um, camera and audio, but you might be able to, it just depends on your computer, I think. And then uh, if you want to see the introduce your webinar options, we've got those two there that you can click on and watch. Are there questions that you have so far? Am I going at a good speed? Are you ready for me to go on? You can either unmute yourself and tell me or pop it into the chat and let me know. It's great for me. Thanks. Okay. Good deal. So the way that I handled this in my classroom, I used it when I was teaching middle school. Um, can you join a grid from dashboard? I'm not sure what you mean by dashboard. If you could give me a little more information on that question. Um, but when I was teaching middle school, I taught seventh and eighth grade science. So I um, tried to have a mix of academic and social topics. screen once you're logged in. So within Flipgrid, once you log in, if you're going to join a grid, you usually have to be invited. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So come, come back to that towards the end if I haven't answered your question. Okay. Um, okay. So I liked having a mix of academic and social things. Um, that allowed students to practice their speaking and listening skills in a format where they have to be a little more formal than when they're talking just with their friends, practicing that language that you would use when you're conversing with um, your teacher as well as your peers is really good for them to do, even if it's not directly content related. And it boosts engagement by having some things that are just purely fun for them. Um, there's more buy-in to the ones that are, um, that are more academically focused and it gets them in the habit of regularly checking and going to those grids. Especially now when they're not able to see some of their friends, um, it's nice to have some, just a social place for them to be as well. That's a little bit more monitored and safe than some of the other corners of the internet they could choose to be on. I would typically have each of my individual classes have one grid and then also have a grid perch subject area. So I had 
four classes of seventh graders that would each have their own grid. And then I would also have one big grid for all of my seventh grade students. So they would choose between whether they were accessing just their grid for their class or whether they were accessing the whole seventh grade class. And so the things that I would put in just their classes were maybe things where they had to do presentations and they didn't want to share their information with their whole grade. But then this bigger one would be shorter topics, um, things where I was soliciting opinions like as a poll that were a little bit less formal and those social topics would sometimes be in there as well. For elementary level, I would probably just have one and have different topics based on what subject you're talking about, just because you don't want have them to have to worry about which grid they're accessing and which flip code they're having to put in. If you have an older elementary class where they're getting ready to go on to middle school where they're going to switch classes, that might not be a bad idea as a transitional thing, but just as a setup, that's, those are some options. I always made my flip grids optional. I really wanted to be respectful of those students who hated the idea of recording their voice or their picture. And so there was always some other option that they could do instead. And that allowed it to be something where everyone could go and look at the videos and benefit from them. But it was just those students who felt comfortable that were doing the posting on there. Okay. Uh, there are tons of ideas that you can get for videos to, um, for, for ways to post videos. One of my favorite is the um, disco library. So up on here, when I'm in my account, I've got my different grids down here. And the disco library is a link that's always up here. And all it is, is a like really good high quality kind of things that Flipgrid's identified as um, things other teachers could benefit from. So let's look at, let's look through here. This, the daily hits or the weekly hits up here are usually pretty fun. So if I wanted to do something social with my students, just to get them used to the format and just to kind of introduce it to them as an icebreaker, I could do this two truths and a lie one. So I'd click on it or not. I could try again. It pops up with all this information. And then right here on select a grid, I can choose our ERC demo and add it to that grid. Now I can edit all of this information that's already populated in here. This is the same screen that pops up if I say create a topic. Um, and so I'm just going to take a minute to go through these different options here. Okay, so it's already given me this information because I chose an existing topic. If not, I would have to put this in myself. It's always good to include a focus and I'm going to go ahead and delete this one just to show you the options down here. You can record your own video to be the focus. So if you want to give more in-depth directions or if you want to show something that you're um, to get your students started with, you absolutely can. You can choose videos from different sources. The easiest option um, I think is adding a Giphy. So let's say icebreaker and see what happens. Okay, we can choose this little dude in a snowsuit breaking some ice with a heart inside. All right. But it's just something visual that will grab your students' attention and make that topic look different than the other topics in there. So it's always good to include a focus. One of the most important things is this recording time. If you're getting ready to push this topic out to maybe 100 middle school students or high school students, uh, even if you're getting ready to push this out to 20 to 30 elementary school students, you want to be really aware of how long it is going to take you to view all their responses because we all have those students who will take the entire time and maybe still not get to their point by the end of it if you let them. So in this recording time, you can go as high as 10 minutes. 10 minutes times 20 kids is what, 200 minutes? That's over three hours. So be very aware of how fast you want these to be. I'll show you what it looks like when you're recording something. Um, it has a countdown timer on top. So students are aware of how much time they have left. And you can definitely tell when they realize, oh, I need to speed it up because I'm getting close to the end. They have the ability to edit their videos so they can cut out sections that they were just rambling during um, or looking for their notes or something and go back and add more. But this is really going to be a good management place where you can decide how much time you want to invest in watching the videos on a particular topic. 
So definitely pay attention to how much your recording time is set to. Um, for video moderation, if you turn this on, this means that no videos will be posted to your grid until um, you check them first and approve them, okay? At first, when I started doing this, I set it so that all my videos were monitored or were moderated where I had to approve them because I was nervous about whether my students were gonna be inappropriate or not. I eventually turned this off because it is just, it's one more step between them making their video and it being available for their students that I didn't wanna to have to go through. And they really proved me wrong that they were gonna be inappropriate. I never had an issue with students um, and that. I will say, with my uh, college students, um, I found out that you can flag videos as a student as inappropriate because one of my students recorded a video in, a, in the wrong topic and then she freaked out and wanted it fixed and so she flagged it as inappropriate and I got an email right away saying like one of your videos has inappropriate content and so I could go back in and look at it. So there is a reporting system if your students um, are are doing things that are inappropriate and another student notices it, it'll remove it right away and notify you. Okay. I have a question. If you work with one student at a time, you can definitely use this with a class size of one. Um, it is asynchronous, so you're, you would be um, maybe setting it up so they would post questions by video that you could then answer. Um, you could also give them topics that you wanted them to do in that program and then they would show you the result of it in their video. So I think you could do this with one student. There's no minimum class size. Okay, continuing down these options for setting up a topic. Um, I should mention again that the way that the, it's organized is your grid is like your classroom, your topic is like your assignment, and then the videos are the students' individual submissions to that assignment or to that topic. A topic tip is just like a really short version of the directions. I think we've all had that student who's not gonna read um, the entire thing if you use all 1,000 characters you're allotted. So this is just the short version. Okay, so I'm just gonna call it two truths, one lie. Okay. You can attach documents to this. So these can be anything from um, your Google Docs or OneNote. Um, they can be videos, so you can include an assignment with this that you want them or a reading that you want them to do before they respond. I probably would never attach nine external links, but you have the option to. Um, as long as it's a URL, you can, you can get that to post with it. Down here with topic status, you can decide when you want to post these. So if you want to set up all your Flipgrids for a month, um, you can set up launch and freeze dates where they'll be available for one week at a time, let's say, and you can have them all set up at the beginning of the month and they'll automatically roll through as you go. Um, you can also copy grids. And so if you're using it one school year and you liked a lot of your topics, you could copy that same grid to your next school year and have all of your um, assignments set up with deadlines, all of your topics set up with these launch and freeze dates so that they would automatically come available when you're teaching that content. Down here, um, this has some more important settings that you want to consider when, and it has a lot to do with how students interact with videos. You can allow videos only, selfies only, or selfies and videos. That is entirely up to you. Um, I like selfies and videos because it's a video platform and it makes sense to me, but I'm sure there are times when it would make more sense to just have still images. Uh, I allow video editing because I want students to be able to chop out things that did not work for them. I let them give a video title. They can include a link. So if you're wanting them to turn in an assignment as well, like let's say you wanted them to have notes that they were working off of for a speech that they were giving, you could include this and they can post a link with their video to whatever document it is that you're requiring alongside of this. View count and likes I usually turn off. Um, likes is kind of a, it's a hairy topic because we know how much students are affected by and motivated by and sometimes discouraged by how they're interacting on social media when it comes to likes. And view count can be the same way as that. If one student's get, video gets three views and another student's video gets 26, that's not, that's not a, a metric I want my students paying attention to. 
So I usually turn both of these off, particularly when I was working at the middle school level. Okay, so that's something to consider whether you want that option on or off. Um, sticky notes are just little text boxes that students can put in the, um, in the video with them. They can put them in there and then turn them off after a certain amount of time. I'll show you that when I'm doing a video myself so that you'll be able to know what I'm talking about. I really like that feature because if a student's listening to their reply and they realize they said the wrong word, they can pop a sticky note in there and say, oh, I meant this, instead of having to re-record their whole thing. Um, it's also a good way to put in additional information that's easier to see written out than it is to just hear. Um, allowing student-to-student -student replies is entirely up to you. This would allow um, one student A to post a video and then student B to give a video response to it. Um, it could be something you require that you want your students replying to each other's videos, or it can be just a nice feature there. The last thing down here is feedback. Basic feedback is just you give them a, a zero through five on ideas and a zero through five on performance. Um, it's just a real simple way to give them some feedback, but there's also this custom feedback where you can create your own rubric, which um, targets whatever areas you're looking at, and you can assign between zero and 100 points for each of those categories. So you can make it narrower, um, and you could you could make it really complex if you wanted to. Um, I usually don't, but that's because I'm pretty loosey goosey with my my Flipgrids. Okay, so now that we've got this in here, um, I can share this with my students, and I can post this link to uh, Microsoft Teams. This embed code is for if you have a website you would like them to access it on. You can share it to Google Classroom or you can post it out through Remind. So it has really good integration with um, these other services that a lot of us are already using. You can also generate a QR code. This is more useful when we're in a physical space together. I know that elementary schools a lot of times, um, if they've got a Flipgrid station, like during centers, uh, maybe it's practicing their sight words as a video. They would have an iPad set up and they would have the QR code on the wall, the iPad, the student just uses it to scan the QR code. It takes them right to Flipgrid and they can record their video and it makes it really simple. I'm not sure QR code makes a lot of sense right now, but it is something that is there. So you can, yeah, I'm gonna leave that one there for right now and I'm gonna show you what it looks like when I record a response. It's not gonna be two truths and a lie because I'm not gonna think that up on the fly, but I just want you to know what this, um, this thing looks like. Okay, and usually it lets me record. Let's hope that that's the case too. So this is what your students will see. Um, they have these options along the bottom. This first one is filters, and this one is actually kind of important because if you do have those students that are super shy, this pixel filter can be really helpful, okay? It's got that like, witness protection, garbling of the screen kind of thing. So if they're so self-conscious about how they look on video, or even self-conscious about the environment they're in, we know that our students sometimes don't want to invite their friends to look at their house and what they, what, how they're living. So this is a good thing to draw your students' attention to, this pixelated filter, if you want to allow them that ability to be a little bit more anonymous. Um, and it's just, it's just kind of fun, right? Like we, we have filters because they're great. You know, you've got the normal, you know, Instagram kind of filters too. So that is an option that's down there in that crystal ball. Um, with text, I can just type over the screen. I could put a giant sticker over my face if I wanted to, instead of having my face there. So if I didn't want to show myself at all, I could just have a big happy face instead of my head and just try to keep my head behind it the whole time and be talking. That is definitely an option. Um, up to you whether you want to tell your students about that. I clicked out of the thing entirely, not what I meant to do. We'll keep rolling with it. The whiteboard or blackboard is really great. You could take a break um, from recording yourself and you can write on this. Right, so if I'm doing a math problem, I can do that on this whiteboard. I can record and say, okay, this is what 
my math problem for the day is three or four times three, which equals 12. And then you could have them draw different things. They could put out stickers in an array to show it. There's a lot of fun math applications with that. And then I recorded that piece, I paused it. I can then go through here and say, I wanna clear my drawing. Oh, up here, I click clear. And then I can go down to the whiteboard and turn off the whiteboard. Um, what's this last one here? I can upload an image. So if your students, um, if you've got a picture of like a presentation slide or something that you want them to put in, they can do that. So I'm just gonna record a little bit more to give you an idea of things. And that's where we're gonna go. I do think I said I'd tell you the sticky note part. So if I've got a sticky note over here, um, I can move it wherever I like, that kind of thing. If I forget what my assignment is, I can click show topic and it'll give me a little reminder. Again, I can do this all while I'm paused and then I can jump back into it and add more to my video. Um, then when I think I've done a good job, I can click next. It gives me the option to review, which I'm definitely not gonna listen to myself talk. I know a lot of us are, oh yeah, I just, I can't, I can't do it. So I would just go right to click and confirm. Okay, Oof. and then um, the last thing to do is to take a selfie, which is the, the like thing that'll go on the screen for their, their peers and for you to see. So a little selfie, put a little hat or something on it, right? That looks like fun, right? Oh yeah, that worked out. Okay, and so then I've got my video. It's probably giving me a countdown timer that I can't see. There we go. It tells me that my video is prepared. I can edit my display name. I can give it a title. There's my option to put in my link if I want to. And then when I click submit video, it's visible on the site. People can respond to it if they want. My teacher can see it here like this. It's got a green circle around it because it's new, which is a great way to keep track of which ones you viewed and which ones you haven't. If I go back over here to the teacher or to the student side, I do have to hit refresh because I added this topic um, since the last time I loaded this page. So I'm gonna go to two truths and a lie. And I can see my video response here and click the big green button if I wanna record my own response. Okay, I went over a whole lot of information. So please um, take, take a moment, ask me questions, either unmute yourself if you're comfortable with me recording your voice or um, send me something in the chat, feel free. Um, what questions do you have? Are there other things you would like to see? What, what else is going on? Okay, if you have questions as we're going along, um, don't hesitate to stop and interrupt and ask me. I, I would love to, this is a really small group, so don't hesitate to, to ask your question. It would benefit all of us. Um, I do wanna show you some really cool accessibility features that are built in um, that are gonna be really helpful. This little button here, you definitely wanna show your students and let them know what it is and what it does and where, how to get to it. It's on every um, grid. And so if I click on this immersive reader, um, it will read me the directions, which I don't think you can hear right now because I didn't click the right button, but it's, it's reading it aloud to me. Okay. It also has different um, text options. So if you have students who do better with certain color backgrounds, um, they can switch it over to that. Some of our students with um, learning disabilities have an easier time reading Comic Sans, so they can switch the font there. Um, they can make the text size bigger or smaller, uh, whatever is gonna make more sense. 
in here you've got grammar options so they can highlight the different parts of speech with different colors. You can also break words into syllables. Um, and then in here, you can set up a line focus for yourself. So if you want to just look at one line at a time, you can do that. Uh, if we've got a little bit more. I have the board maker picture dictionary turned on, but I'm not sure. It has not been working well for me lately. Um, I want to say if I click on a word, it should tell me what that word is. Yeah, so if I click on it, the board maker icons will come up, but they don't always work. So it's not, it's not a perfect solution um, for that. It can also auto translate into several languages if you have students who are not native English speakers who would like to see that, or if you have students who are working on a foreign language and you would like to do that. Yes, you absolutely can record videos from your phone. Um, and that's honestly how a lot of my students would do it. They'd be out and about having dinner with their family at a restaurant and recording with their phone while they were while they were waiting for their food. So it's really it's really great in that way that um, it gives a lot of flexibility. And I really like that feature because I could ask my students to go outside and like find a leaf or record something that they saw that they couldn't identify. Um, and so that's it's it's really nice to have it available on those portable platforms too. There's another accessibility feature that I want to show you and it has to do with setting up a grid. So I'm going to go back to the educator side and get out of this. I'm going to go back to my grids and I'm going to go through the process of creating a new grid and those are like a class. Okay, so Maybe um, maybe this year I'm teaching sixth grade science, okay? So I'll give it that title. Um, it should be something that makes it really obvious that your student is in the right place. So that's something that's helpful. I have options here where students can join using a school email. What you do for this is you then you put in which URLs um, or which domains you'll allow. So I'm going to just practice going on to next and then I'll come back and look at some other options. I'm registered in with my Fairmont State email address, so that's automatically in there. Um, you want to be careful about which domains. Like I started this one and my students couldn't get in because I forgot that they were at students.fairmontstate.edu. So you can add as many domains as you want and then your pool of people who are allowed in is limited to people who have an email address at that domain. So if you choose to go this way with school email, your students have to log in with this ending that you have. Okay, does that sort of make sense? And that's a good option for older students who have access to their email addresses. If that isn't the case, um, then you can create a student ID for them. Okay, so next, what I would do is I would put in like, I don't know, and maybe he's student number one, okay? You can upload a CSV file, which is just a spreadsheet as well. So if you have that all ready to go, you can upload that instead. Um, but you could also just put in your students and then give them an identifier, a student ID, which can be anything from two digits to like eight digits or something like that. So for younger students, this is gonna be a better option if they don't have access to their email. Um, so they would just have to remember what their number was to let them in. I, I don't know if it'll work with letters. Yeah, so you could have their identifier be just their name as well, okay, as long as they have a unique name. Okay, so that's, that's a good option for younger students. Um, if you want a public or a PLC, I would probably keep that to adults only because we have so many um, things that we need to be more cognizant of privacy wise with students. So I would keep this to be adults only, but with this one, anyone with your flip ID can, can be added to it, okay? So down here, it automatically assigns me a flip code. This is what your students are going to type in. So on this page, when it says enter a flip code, that's what they'll have to type. Personally, I don't want this to be something that has a weird number in it because I don't want my students to have to remember a weird number every time. So I might do maybe my last name and our mascot. Okay, and so they would type in that. And as long as it's something that hasn't been used before, it'll show up green as available here. 
And then when your students go to type it in, it'll be something that's a little bit more memorable. Okay, so I would, I would go for something that's words and not random letters or random numbers. Okay, so I've got that set up. Um, because I'm choosing it to be a public PLC, I can add a password or not. Um, I don't really want to this time, but there's, there's options there. I'm gonna delete this grid like as soon as we're done here anyway. I'm just shutting, showing you how to set it up. Again, I can um, share through these different ways and then I'm gonna to go to the grid, okay? So now that I'm in here, there's a couple things I wanna show you on our new grid. It automatically picks a picture for you, but you can change that at any time. If I am co-teaching with someone, I can add a co-pilot. So I could put an administrator on here if I wanted. Um, I could put a special education teacher if I had a resource teacher assigned to this. So they just need to have a Flipgrid account. You put in their email, and if they don't have a Flipgrid account, it'll give them instructions for how to set one up. And then you can all be basically administrators on this account, review student videos, um, change settings. And so it's a great way to collaborate with other teachers. If you're a part of a team, um, or if you're um, working with students who have other teachers associated with them, okay? It puts in this automatic say hello on Flipgrid um, grid or topic for you, uh, which is nice. Uh, one thing I wanna show you how to set up is another accessibility feature. And to do that, I think you edit grid. Let's hope that's where we're going. Okay, so I can change all those settings that I had. I can decide how often I receive email notifications about my grid. So if I don't want emails, I can just set it to never. If I want an email every time someone posts, which I recommend against personally, I can. Um, that is up to you. You can allow students to download and share their videos or not. I'm probably gonna turn that off because I don't think they need to be keeping videos. Um, I think that's just for their own though. So I would probably leave that on, up to you. This one is the one that I want to talk to you about. It will auto-generate captions for your files. So if you have students who would benefit from having captions at the bottom, it will automatically do that to your videos. And I thought that it used, I thought that you had to have that turned on before the videos were recorded, but actually as soon as you turn it on, it goes back and auto-captions everything. It just takes a little while for it to go through the videos. Um, it's not perfect. It, especially if your student is um, not speaking with exactly standard English accent, um, or if there's any kind of background noises, it's going to be a little bit garbled, but you as the teacher can go in and edit the caption file if it becomes necessary to do that. I definitely like that this is an option, um, and I think that having captions on benefit more of our students than just those who are hearing impaired or deaf. Um, I can put a new picture in from here as well. I can choose pictures. So I'm just going to click update grid and, and that's our topic there. Okay. Questions, things you want to see more of. If you want to play around with recording a video, you can definitely use this flip code um, and put something in the say hello. Uh, right now from your phone if you would like to. As I said, I'll be deleting this one, so don't, don't feel like it's going to be in there for posterity if uh, you don't want it to be in there. But that's just a way for you to play around with it while we're looking through this. Okay, so I did that. This is the description of those accessibility features I talked about, both here and in how to turn on the caption files. So you have a copy of that um, if you would like to. Oh, I definitely want to talk about speed settings. Okay. Interrupt me if you have a question, but I do have another cool thing to show you. I'm gonna go look at Josh's because I definitely don't want to watch my own video. And he did a really nice job and I appreciate it. Okay. So, adding graphs as a sticker, I don't, you could, you could have them upload their own images, absolutely. Um, they could also just hold up, like, 
an image as they're talking. I've definitely done that before and had students do that. So that's another option if you think that they're going to be more comfortable with hand drawing a graph than they are having it on the screen. But if you're doing something that is having them doing online graphing, they absolutely could take that as a screenshot and then upload it in as an image that they could use. It could also be their link that they provide. So that's, that's, there are a couple ways to accomplish that. Okay, so as I said earlier, this can be a huge time sink in terms of evaluation, but this little uh, gear wheel down here is your best friend because you can change the playback speed to twice as fast and get through the videos twice as quickly. We all have that student who um, talks very slowly and we don't want to spend all of our time waiting for them to get to the point. So you pop it onto 2x. Josh talks really fast anyway, so I probably wouldn't for him. But it is good to know that it's there, okay? And that is, ooh, that is within the video itself. And then once you change it to 2x, um, it'll do that for all of the videos until you change it to something slower. If you do have a kid who's going too fast, you can slow it down. Um, it is entirely your preference, but that's in there and I want you to be aware of it because it can be really helpful. Uh, you also have the option to watch these videos full screen, which can be good if you have um, this video is, is showing you graphics or something like this, okay? So that's definitely something to look at. If I want to, um, I'm not in this one as the administrator, I'm in this one as a student. So let me get back to my educator page and show you some of the educator options. So that's, those features are available for students as well. And so you could talk to them about watching things fast or slow and that's its own kind of hilarious. And the more fun they have with this, the more buy-in they're gonna have. So not a bad thing to talk about. And I clicked on the wrong thing again. I always want to click this, but it views it as a student. I want to click on the picture or anywhere else. So now I'm in here um, and I am looking at things as a teacher, as an evaluator. And so now when I click on it, it not just shows me the video, but it also gives me these, <laughs> these options over here, okay? So, I'm going to slow it back down. My grading rubric, remember I just used the default one for this and so I've just got a zero to five score for ideas and per for performance. I can also give feedback and then I can click this button to send it to the person's email if they registered with an email account, okay? That wouldn't be possible for the those students that have the younger age level. They would have to go back into Flipgrid to see their feedback, um, but I can give them a lot of options there. Vibe is just a short phrase that shows on top of here. And so I'm just gonna rename it. Oh, I can't do all of that. It is really short. There we go. So you could put up here um, something that you really want other kids who are watching the video to pay attention to, like great volume or um, wow, look at that graph. That would be too long, but you get the idea. You can put up this and other students who view the video after you put that on there will see that and it'll call their attention to something. If you love it, you can feature it as a response and so it'll show up with a little star with it. You can also click spark video and that will create a whole new topic based off of this video. So this video will be the content focus for that topic and it'll be underneath. So this would be cool if you were doing um, collaboration around something and you're trying to brainstorm a bunch of different ideas. If you saw a kid who had a really good idea that you wanted to have some more discussion about, you could spark it as a new topic and other things would fall underneath. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I get the idea of not wanting to put more on our students' plate right now at this point in the school year. So definitely getting some training on it and getting comfortable with it would be um, a good plan. Uh, it is, it, it wouldn't hurt to give it as an option for students to give it set up and see if they enjoy it or do some troubleshooting now so you can be up and running in the fall, but I'm not going to tell you to do more right now than you guys are already doing, okay? Sparking a video is one thing. You can also add response to mixtapes, and mixtapes are basically what they sound like. They're like a playlist where you curate different videos. So you could have multiple student responses that you pull together in a particular mixtape, 
and maybe they're really good examples of scientific thinking or really good examples of how to give a presentation. Um, and so those would be things that you could pull together and say, hey, take a look at these if you need ideas for what you need to improve with your practice, okay? Um, if a student put the response in a wrong grid, you can move it to, a, or in the wrong topic, you can move it to a different topic. You can copy, delete, download all these different things from this um, educator panel here. You can retitle it, you can change their name or email. Um, this is the link that Josh put in for this. And so if the link was wrong, you could edit it here. This flip code will take you directly to this video. Um, so there's a lot of different options there. And then I can also share just this video on those different platforms that we talked about before. Okay. Uh, this guest code is also kind of cool. Um, if you have a grid where you would like parents, families, grandparents to be able to see uh, the, the videos for that, like maybe you're going to do um, a Mother's Day video and the kids talk about their moms or grandparents or grandmothers or things like that. Uh, you can send out this guest code and then other people can watch the videos on that particular grid. That's definitely something you want to be careful with though because you're inviting people from outside in. Um, it can also be good if you're doing something like Skype a scientist or one of those things where you have an outside expert coming in and talking to your students. You can give that outside expert this code and then they can talk to your students and give them video responses and things like that. So there's there's so much functionality in Flipgrid and there's so many cool ways to collaborate. I just, I think it's a really good tool, especially now that we're doing some um, distance thing. Okay. Um, you can integrate it as a tab within Teams if that's something that you're using. You can grade it through Google Classrooms if you're using it. I talked about the pixelated fix, uh, filter. Oh. Another thing that I forgot to mention, that topic moderation that you can turn on, that's a way to have one-way communications with your students. So you can treat it like an office hours. You can have one topic that's just for like video conferences. Your student can post questions. You leave it moderated so you never make it visible. And then that's just something where you and that student can talk back and forth. You can add videos underneath as responses as well. Um, excuse me, but if you don't ever approve it for moderation, it'll only be visible to, um, to, your, to you, okay? So that's one, another way that some teachers have used that. Okay, so this is, this is it. I went a little bit longer than I planned on. I apologize for that, but if you are done, I'm gonna post this link into the chat as well for everyone. Please go ahead and fill out our survey. Um, it, you get a certificate emailed to you if you do that says that you attended this training for one hour. There's a pretty online version and there's a black and white version. So if you need to print it for a portfolio or something, you can do that. The survey is something that we use to report on our grant to show that we're doing educational outreach and working with teachers. Um, but I am happy to stick around and help anyone get their accounts set up. Um, answer any questions that you have, but I also want to respect your time. And if you have other things that you need to get done today, I'm sure you have other things you need to get done today, you can head out here. Um, I'll be sending an email follow up that has the link to this document, our survey, um, a couple other helpful things, and uh, the recording of this video as well. So this is. Um, Flipgrid has a lot of great resources for helping you get off the ground. So don't feel like I'm the only way that you're going to be able to get your Flipgrid up and running. They do a great job walking you through the process and making it pretty intuitive. Okay, I think I'm going to stop recording now. If I can figure out how to do that. And then we'll open it up to just individual questions and things like that.